everyone, and welcome to the newest episode of the Read Right to Left podcast. I am G, joined by my always wonderful co-host, Ray, from Whimsical Pictures. Hi, guys. And this month we are going to be talking about, I guess, a type of manga? It's not really a genre. It's not really a... We're, we're talking about prequels and or sequels of manga. Yeah. Uh, typically these are spin-offs of very large franchises. Sometimes it's a continuation of a work that got um, cut p- before its time, uh, depending yeah. on the magazine. And sometimes it's just, you know, you have a smash hit success and you don't really want to think about a new idea, so you just reinvent <laughs> the same idea. And people will try it because it's related to the original thing that they liked um we see a lot just like the movie (laughs) exactly (laughs) we see a lot of this um across the industry uh obviously there's plenty of plenty just in every genre but you see a lot of it within the big shonen and seinen hits but without further ado we don't have any questions this month namely because i didn't ask for questions until very very last minute so apologies if you did have something This topic is one that we've had on our list for quite a while. Um, I don't know what inspired it, whether it was uh, Chainsaw Man's Mm -hmm. uh, sequel getting... I mean, we kind of always knew that it was going to happen, but there was an announcement that it was going to happen. Or maybe we were trying to coincide it with They Were Eleven, um, despite its constantly moving release date. Uh, because that book is going to include the sequel to the story as well. Uh, but it's just kind of been a rainy day topic on there for when... (laughs) A long time. uh, We needed something without too huge of a, uh, reading backlog to Mm. accomplish. (laughs) Absolutely. So, I think it's fairly self-explanatory, but a prequel manga is... A series that is set prior to the original series, usually focusing on like a spin off character, a mentor character in their younger years, um, the early days of the setting. Like, if there's been a, if the main series is about a zombie apocalypse, then the prequel might be about the initial outbreak, that kind of thing. Um, or kind of the parents as i said pen- parents or mentors of the main characters um mm-hmm. there's a diff- there's different ways to do all of these things uh but that's typically what a prequel manga is because it's close enough to characters you probably already like from the original series um that you would probably as a fan be invested enough to like check out the hey uh, what's their origin story if it's not extensively covered in the original series <laughs> and then of course sequel manga are series that are set after the original series uh usually featuring a, either a the next generation of characters whether those be direct descendants a la boruto or whether it's just like the next the ne- well, like, Chihai Furu has a sequel, and that's about the next Karuta Club um, from that same yeah, school. I was thinking, like, Genshiken, like mm-hmm. the next generation of that club. Mm-hmm. So that's, again, kind of, it's, it's tangentially related to the thing you like. Uh, sequels, often you'll get a cameo from the original characters, so if so fans are like, oh my goodness, I remember that character that I love. <laughs> what? How are they going at age 25? Um, and Literally me with the Last Exile sequel, only watching it because Dio is still alive. <laughs> exactly. Oh my goodness, yes. Um, and so, you know, there's that. Or also, like, a good example of a sequel, I guess also sort of a spin-off that we've seen just recently was Kimini Todoke, wherein the female rival character gets her romantic, uh, you know, storyline finalized, fleshed out, Um, which is kind of funny because obviously Kimini Todoke, the original series, is 30 volumes. 
and then <laughs> this this sequel is three volumes and I'm like that's because that character knows what she wants and goes for it <laughs> she doesn't have an paw <laughs> for 27 volumes <laughs> I say that with all the love in my heart for Kimi and Todd, okay, but like you know, it's they're very different <laughs> animals. Also, like uh, you know, there's there's a level of is, are these secondary characters strong enough on their own to maintain a sequel? Um, mm-hmm. So sometimes the answer is yes. Uh, we see it a lot in BL as well. Like a lot of times, the side couples will have. Yeah, 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 story and very often beauty as well. Yeah, it oftentimes that will be like way better than the original like one shot or whatever series. Um, I don't know why that seems to happen a lot, <laughs> but I think maybe because usually the original couple will be very like I don't know safe, sweet, yeah, milk toast. Uh, <laughs> and then, like, the beta couple is, like, the really weird, fucked up shit that the author actually wanted to write. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, everyone has mommy issues, and, like, it will... Autom- I'm thinking of that, um, the frickin' Ogeretsu Tanaka one, where it's, like, the main couple was, like, pretty vanilla, mm. and then, but, like, one of the main characters had, like run from an abusive ex and then mm-hmm. guess what the spin-off manga was about <laughs> well like um oh what am i what's the one that i'm thinking of jealousy that's a spin-off manga of like a mm-hmm. of a different series and mm-hmm. that was like so much more interesting and i didn't dislike the original series but I'm like man jealousy was messy characters doing messy things and i'm here for it I want to see that <laughs> true love bloom. Um, yeah, it was. It, so we do see that a lot in this, in these more uh, smaller genres. Maybe is the right word. Uh, smaller <laughs> or more niche romance genres as well. I was not... gonna say in terms of volume. No, no, not in volume, but no. like. <laughs> but it's you see it across the board with romance. It's not just a hit romance thing yeah it it is very 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 prolific in bl which is why i brought it up um to your point yuri as well um i guess just because people like reading about love but also they like reading about (laughs) fucked up love um so you know all good (laughs) and then (laughs) and then there's also stuff that's set within the same world but like doesn't really have anything to do with the original characters the original issue the original series a good example of this is uh, The King's Beast which is a spin off that's the one I thought of immediately but I'm also like at one point at what point is it a sequel versus Mm -hmm. a cinematic universe (laughs) exactly (laughs) like hmm (laughs) hmm uh, I mean, get, uh, technically, this is a... also like mm. a lot of BL, like the char- like those BL mangaka, they'll do like the clamp star system thing. Yes, yeah. Where it's like yeah. characters, the main characters from their different series will like all be in the same city, but like never meet. Like they'll mm-hmm. pass each other on the streets, mm-hmm. but you'll get like a weird cameo and be like, I guess they're all. In the same universe? Question mark. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> one that's I don't know, notorious isn't quite the right word, for, but like, um, what's her name? World's greatest first love, Junja Romantica. All of those. Shungiku. Yeah. Nakamura. Nakamura, I think. Uh, all of her series exist within the same universe, including I think Hybrid Child, which is a, a bit of a weird one to throw in there. <laughs> those series all kind of are bundled together they exist within the same universe um is there is there any like particular genre that you think really lends itself well to this kind of prequel and or sequel i mean i i do think romance kind of lends itself to it because i feel like there's a lot of romance readers who get Mm -hmm. really attached to like those 
beta couples. Mm-hmm. Um, I certainly have before. So it's it's always and it's an easy place to go, right? Like mm. you don't have to pick up a whole <laughs> complicated <laughs> plot line. You just are like, well, how do these two characters start dating after mm. you finished writing the story about how those other two characters started dating? <laughs> really, you can just keep going and keep going. Like you can like beta couples all the way down if you wanted to. I agree. I, I think it also allows for like because very often creators, romance creators, will um, feature these beta couples or feature rival characters who later on get their own romantic love interest. Um, but it, I do know that quite a common complaint is that when those secondary couples are integrated or explored in the original series, like the main series, your, your main couple has fallen in love and had their happily ever after and then we have to focus on like two or three other couples and resolve their plot lines um, within that same original series. And so I think, yeah, and which can drag out the length a lot. And if you don't actually care about, you know, the two classmates who are giving googly eyes to <laughs> each other, um, you can just, like that can be quite annoying. Um, so I think that it's a pretty easy middle ground to, like, serve those fans who do want to read more about these other couples, whilst also allowing people who don't care about those characters to, like, skip over it if they don't want to read about them. Um, (laughs) you know, there's no correct answer in doing this, of course, uh, and also there's no guarantee that there'll be enough interest for, you know, secondary couple to have a spin-off. Um, but I do think it's an Justify easy... the print run. Yeah. <laughs> but I do think it's an easy win for someone coming off of a prior hit or, like, a, a previous work and then not... If they don't necessarily have, like, the next great opus fully formed in their head yet, they can just rely on... These are familiar characters in a fairly <laughs> familiar situation and people do actually want to see what's happening to them and I don't have enough of a idea yet for another completely new story so maybe let's use this as a bit of a buffer until <laughs> I have a new cool idea. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but I think it'd be a pretty funny like shoujo gag series if like every chapter you like go from the main couple of that chapter to, like, an increasingly obscure background character (laughs) until it's, like, two earthworms falling in love or something. (laughs) Um, But, like, I know in some cases, like, in the case of um, Fruits Basket Another, Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, um, it's kind of a case where she... Um, you know, her health has always been shaky, right? Mm -hmm. And I know that she started Fruits Basket Another as, like, a promo. I don't know, for the new anime or something. Mm -hmm. Um, but it ends up being kind of a middle ground where it's, like, you don't have to focus too much on it, like, if you're, say, recuperating your health or something. Mm -hmm. Um... So I do think there are some sequels that are kind of in that vein as well, um, where which, which might contribute to the idea that they're kind of an afterthought. Yeah. Um, yeah. In the case of, like, romance stuff in particular, because I definitely think there's more, like, within Shonen, mm. uh, where it's just, like, this is the second leg of the story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we we changed the name. We slapped a new sticker on it. Here's more of the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then in those cases, like, the sequel will be, you know, the same length or even longer than mm-hmm. the first part, so. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think also... Because, like, I'm thinking specifically Shonen Jump. There's a lot of mm-hmm. spin-off stuff, or I guess, again, prequel, sequel stuff, 
that is not just the second half of the story necessarily, but because there are such like huge smash hit sensation, uh, pop culture darlings, global phenomena. Um, I'm thinking like obviously Naruto is a great example of this. Um, you do have even like Jujutsu Kaisen does have a prequel uh, single volume, which when that came out was a way to introduce an upcoming character into the main series. Um, mm-hmm. It was set before Jujutsu Kaisen, but and so featured a different main character. But then that main character was then integrated into kind of the larger cast of the main series. Um, just giving him a little bit of backstory and, you know, it gave him a, it a bit more time to flesh out his power set and, you know, all that, all that junk. Um, so that readers did have a bit of more context of, like, who this person is before just dropping him into the main series, but then also not having to completely screech the plot to a halt in order to, like, introduce <laughs> a new character. Um... Which can often happen. Uh, so when you are like an action adventure uh, series that wants to focus on like this very large cast of ver- very varied personalities, um, that's also a way to do that. Again, you see it, uh, but in saying that, like, I I will, I'm going to admit that I have not read Boruto. I really don't have any interest in reading Boruto. Um, as, as the, like, second generation of the cast, and specifically being, like, the children of the original cast, doesn't interest me. Um, I think there's ways to do that interestingly, and... Obviously, it works because Boruto is still going, right? Um, But I'm just kind of reminded that uh, this creator did actually try to have a new series, and then nobody liked it, and then... (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. Boruto isn't even... Boruto isn't even drawn by Kishimoto. I know, himself. but you you could imagine that Kishimoto still gets, like, a shit ton of money from... Well, yeah, obviously. I'm sure he gets tons of royalties. So it's... Whether the the sequel is good or bad, um, it's a lot less of a time investment from him, again, because he's not drawing (laughs) it. Um, But also, it does have these, like, truly dedicated Naruto fans. And I'm sure, like, maybe there's some organic... Boruto fans out there, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Just like the idea of a Boruto fan <laughs> is inherently comedic. To me. I know. Like it's someone, weird. someone who's not like an OG Naruto fan. Mm-hmm. Someone who specifically like just goes really hard for for Boruto. <laughs> like this is my favorite series. Oh my god, what do you mean there's this huge prequel? <laughs> and they get like really super frustrated anytime it it kind of, it features Naruto or Sakura or Sasuke. It's like, oh my god, can we get back they're to like... the characters I care about? <laughs> yeah, and they're like, you know what? I tried that prequel series and like honestly, I don't get the hype. Like it was boring. I hated it. Uh <laughs> There's a not zero percent chance that that person exists out there. Um, <laughs> I don't necessarily want to meet them, but there's a non zero. I kind chance. of, I kind of want to become them, but I can't because I've already read Naruto. <laughs> it's also like I, I have guess to invent a time machine. <laughs> <laughs> I also think that like. Naruto is a good example because I I think I've seen people ask the question of like, well, why isn't there like, and there's in saying this, there are a bunch of prequel like novels and stuff to Naruto, uh, not a manga, but like, why hasn't there been a a prequel about Naruto's dad, Minato, uh, right, who was the Hokage prior, 
And it's like, because you know what happens to him in Naruto. Like, <laughs> you don't... Do you really want to read a, a even a five-volume series about this character's dad? And yeah, he was maybe <laughs> a cool guy and had an interesting life. But, like, you know that he will be dead because, spoilers for a 30-year-old manga, but... Naruto is an orphan. Like, he doesn't have parents. <laughs> <laughs> he, from chapter one, has been alone pretty much his entire life. Well, actually, his entire life. So, I don't know. Like, maybe there's no real urge to read about Minato because ultimately you're like, well, that's... He, he gets enough, like to do, quote-unquote, in the series itself. They, there are chapters that feature both of Naruto's parents and, you know, they're prior to their death. But, like, you can't have a successful story when a, a acknowledged fan of the series already knows that this character is dead before you go into it. Um... Hey. Hey. <laughs> Speak for yourself, G.G., considering the absolute encyclopedias... <laughs> full of marauders fan fiction that well that's that's what i it. that's kind of what i mean right is like <laughs> there's a there's probably a reason why you know she who must not be named didn't just jump to telling marauder stories even though it would have been easy money because it's like well oh she's gonna do it you yeah, know she's well she it. will now the do mold it in her walls is gonna get she, her to do she, it she, yeah exactly <laughs> she she is now because she's none of her other books have done well and she's desperately trying to cling to relevancy and love it or hate it harry potter is still like a huge franchise internationally um and so there will be people who will read it and or watch it in some capacity but like she already tried that with um, <laughs> Fantastic Beasts, and like I don't know how the the book version of that first movie did, but I know nobody liked the second movie. I didn't. I <laughs> so, <laughs> and that was with like a more interesting premise than than just like oh here's the characters main character's dad and his friends like hanging out in high school. Um, <laughs> Which is ostensibly what, like, a, a prequel to Naruto would be. It's like, this is the main character's dad hanging out in Ninja High School. And, um, maybe <laughs> before follow... the world was in crisis. <laughs> before the world was in crisis. Um, and here's his five volumes of his adventures. Oh, isn't it wonderful? He falls in love with this, this sweet other ninja lady. And then... And then you do a sequel to that manga about <laughs> his best friend and, like, the the girlfriend that he finds <laughs> writes itself. <laughs> do you really want to give that much uh, power to Kishimoto to write female characters? I don't, I don't think so. Um, I think the best friends should be a Yuri couple. <laughs> <laughs> well, he does write BL so so very well um so you know exactly nothing more romantic than that one um chapter title page uh <laughs> with the with the matching lockets <laughs> um but enough about like Boruto because this is not actually a series <laughs> either of us have read so we are maybe <laughs> casting horrible aspersions onto it, it it's probably fine well <laughs> it's probably fine well, <laughs> I do think it brings up the question though like at, at least not not Boruto's existence mm. but um, <laughs> the the potential existence of a Minato prequel that uh, <laughs> you were talking about yeah uh, and the idea of a Marauders prequel god mm. Mm. Um, it, it brings up I guess sort of a common aspersion i don't know about sequels in general mm -hmm. and i definitely see it directed at sequel manga as well mm -hmm. the idea that just in their existence that they're kind of fundamentally selling out um 
Are I I think neither of us is gonna like be be the type to like make such a black and white assertion <laughs> about it because there's definitely like sequels and prequels that merit existing mm-hmm. and you know <laughs> like are good. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I'm wondering like. Are there any that you've read that that you feel like were very cynically made like that? Um, uh, one you mentioned earlier being Fruits Basket, another. I don't think it's like the worst I've ever read. I I don't think it's necessary. I can also, in saying that, understand the argument that it's like it's nice to see the next generation of the Somas like being happy which is obviously like a big <laughs> part of fruits basket um yeah is being that happy being good parents <laughs> mm-hmm. unlike their own um, parents <laughs> and unlike naruto in the boruto sequel <laughs> allegedly um... hey that is a a long-standing shonen tradition um, <laughs> i always look forward to uh jojo protagonists Becoming the worst. becoming the worst father yeah. ever. <laughs> Joseph Joestar, just <laughs> the worst. Just incredibly bad. Um, yeah, I mean, as I said, I don't, do I think it's a necessary sequel? No. Do I think it's understandable as to why it was created by the creator? Yes, as Ray said, is like a easy, not easy, but like a easier work to manage with ongoing health issues and there's probably a lot of interest and fan demand in something like that and well and i mean i believe it was created as a promotional and that's that kind of also reminds me of it not a manga but like spice and wolf also has a sequel Mm -hmm. novel series which was initiated with the 10th anniversary of the original novel series um Mm -hmm. Which, like, also has its goods and bads. I don't, again, I don't think it's a necessary sequel. I don't really care for it. But it's, like, I can understand why people would be, like, interested in that. Um, One that I read, well, this really cynical stuff for me is, like, all of the Attack on Titan prequel spinoff stuff. Um... There's uh, one featuring uh, Levi's backstory, which, like, <laughs> pretty, I don't know, kind of, like, completely counters his in-universe backstory in the main series. Yeah, but who cares? No, I don't care. I'm just <laughs> saying. It's like, you know that that was only made because, one, Attack on Titan is, like, hugely crazy popular and two like levi is a very popular character so like there was no it was a shoujo series specifically yeah yeah are we talking about before the fall no before the fall is a different one that's the oh my god (laughs) that's what i'm saying like there's a lot of attack on titan ones he's so ugly too (laughs) before the fall is like anyway i don't i don't i read one volume and was like this is boring um (laughs) <laughs> this is when I was still reading Attack on Titan, and I didn't like even the main series, so I don't know why I kept reading, like, prequels, but maybe I was just searching <laughs> for something interesting. Uh, Before the Fall is features a guy who I think does also end up in the, the whatever their army is, you know, the bloody, the, whatever. The Nazis, uh, whatever. Yeah. The evil monster jews i don't know no no the 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 fighting people that aaron and whatever are part of initially um uh, the ranger corps or whatever um i think the main character is part of that but like his special point of differentiation is that if i'm remembering correctly he was born from Oh, yeah, so his mother was pregnant, and then she got, like, half eaten by a titan, or, like, full eaten by a titan, and then her body expelled the pregnancy, and so he was born. So he's, like, 
a child of titans or something i don't know it's weird um so yeah i don't know (laughs) 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 and that series has like 17 volumes just by the way um i said i only read one but in saying that 17 volumes is exactly half of the original attack on titan length um so you know I don't know who was reading it. <laughs> There's lots of fans of Attack on Titan. I do know who was reading it. I do not think it was a necessary series. Um, I don't think Attack on Titan was a necessary series. Well, yes, um, that too. But like, so you can understand. Anyway, it, yeah, it 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 was enough of a smash hit that like I understand why there is a bunch of cynical spinoffs uh, featuring every like character that quote-unquote is cool um Mm -hmm. there's the annie prequel lost girls uh manga one volumes about annie one volumes about uh what's her name um mikasa um that wasn't necessary again especially because (laughs) you like learn about are these all prequels or did some of them take place during the series i think the Lost Girls ones, kind like, a lot of it was prequel, and then some of it was, like, in-universe coinciding with, quote-unquote, current events or whatever. Um, but, you know. Here's where we get into the uh, murky waters between, like, prequels and uh, spin-offs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, point is that, like, again, these are two characters that in Attack on Titan, have a lot of backstory and feature a lot of the story telling, right? Like, Mikasa's mm-hmm. in the entire series. Annie is a fairly major character for a large portion of it. Did we need an additional two volumes that really add nothing? Because, like, we know their backstory. It's in the main series. We kind of already know what they were doing in the main series, because they were in the main series. They weren't... This wasn't needed. This wasn't needed. Um, yeah. <laughs> Very... <laughs> that, like, Attack on Titan and its various iterations, we're not even going to get into the spin-offs because those are a whole other, like, horrible kettle of fish. Um, but that's kind of the most egregious. Again, I don't think there's... There has been another series quite like it to get that kind of international popularity across the board in a while. Um, It also, like, brings to question something like One Piece, right? Where obviously that series isn't ending anytime soon. Oda always says, like, it'll end in five years. That's bullshit. It's never going to end. But, like, for argument's sake, if it did end in the next five years... And, you know, Attack on, oh, Attack on Time. One Piece uh, at volume 138 was the last one. And the world rejoiced and, you know, everybody decided to have their <laughs> you know, uh, number one of its uh, peak goat manga series. Um, <laughs> Did he be back the very next month with One Piece 2? Either One Piece 2 <laughs> or like a spinoff of, I don't know, one of the villains or something like uh, there is a i would argue that there is no way that one piece the main series will end but i if it does i 100 percent guarantee that oda will not move on from that world which fans would argue is like mm-hmm. well it's just such a wonderful involved universe like of course we have there's a squajillion character stories that he can tell and like sure but also I feel like that's quite boring. I, I don't know. <laughs> if, if you argue that Oda is this creative master genius um, of storytelling, uh, wouldn't you want to see like a completely different setting from him? Or do a completely new thing with new characters? Probably. Well, I would, if I was a fan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I feel like I don't know. Because I'm kind of thinking back to, like, the King's Beast. And I don't mm. mind that that's set in 
no. the world of Dawn of the Arcana because I think that that world's concept of Ajin is interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wouldn't mind if she kept just coming up with different stories that take place in different parts of the mm-hmm. world that that takes place in. Um, but, but my my I cons- am a my noted cons- Anne Rice fan. Uh-huh. So <laughs> <laughs> my concerns, I specific because I I don't disagree. I think there is like for my cynical play just there. It I do think that there's like a lot of potential for different stories within that one piece world universe, whatever you want to call it. Uh, there's a lot mm-hmm. of very interesting settings. There's a lot of interesting characters. Um, this story basically like reinvents itself every arc. Um, but Mm -hmm. I don't know that I trust Oda to do a different kind of story in that world. Like it, it, Mm -hmm. would it be interesting to, apologies everyone, because I don't remember any of the arcs names in or any of the place names or anything in One Piece in the 600 chapters I read. But there's like an underwater <laughs> city and that's full of mermaids and stuff. It would be interesting to just have like, you could do like just kind of a slice of life mermaid fun series set in that city. And you're, or like you could have kind of a bartender esque. Oh, this is a guy who runs a restaurant in one of these crazy towns that they go to. And these are all the kooky, you know, re- regular uh, attendees that like a cheer style story. But you're not mm-hmm. going to get that, right? <laughs> you're going to get another plucky young adventurer pirate. You could even say like there'd be interest in uh, a character who's like joined the Marines because I know that's a, like a thing in who and they're the villains I guess in, within this one piece pirate world. Um that would be interesting, but I just know that that's not what would happen. It would be like another plucky young boy wanting to go on an adventure with pirates and it would be a whole different cast of characters, but also like would it really be a whole different cast of characters? I don't think so. (laughs) Look, he could make a series set in the One Piece universe that is not a uh, shonen adventure series with a plucky male protagonist. But he's not going to. Just like he's not going to stop promoting all of his creepy friends who are pedophiles. Exactly. So, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Precisely. Um, is, okay, so I've, that, that was kind of off the subject of what I was talking about before, but like, <laughs> do you, what about yourself, Ray? Is there anything like in particular, especially sequel or prequel wise, that just seems really cynical and unnecessary? Uh, I definitely agree with, like, Fruits Basket. Another didn't really do anything for me. Like, in fact, as someone whose favorite manga is Fruits Basket, uh, to me, it kind of contradicts quite a bit of character development from various characters in the original series. Just Mm -hmm. the idea that they would all stay in the same, like, metro area of Mm -hmm. Tokyo and send their kids to the same high school (laughs) kind of is like I thought part of this series was about maybe learning that you can cut out the toxic elements in your life Mm -hmm. family elements maybe Mm -hmm. that you can always (laughs) grow and change and move on there's a lot of characters at the end of that series who just move Mm mm-hmm like, they just move far away because, you know, it's time. And to undo that feels like a bit of a betrayal to what this, what is important to me about the series. Mm-hmm. I definitely agree with, or not agree, because I disagree, 
But I understand where people are coming from who find it very healing to see these characters uh, happy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And their kids Mm -hmm. (laughs) well-adjusted. I get that. That isn't what I got out of it. Yeah. Um, It definitely feels like a Harry Potter epilogue kind of thing. (laughs) Here's, you know, Toru and Kyo's kid who's just like them or whatever. Mm. Um, Just not interesting. And again, I think it was created as like a promotion for the anime or something. Mm -hmm. So it's like the very definition of cynical, (laughs) I guess. Even though, like, I, I know why it exists. I don't begrudge Takaya for making it or anything. And I mm. think it, it it's certainly fine. Like, it could have been way worse than it was. <laughs> and it, it, it comes in and it gets out after mm-hmm. three volumes, which we know I always respect. <laughs> um, but definitely, yeah, that one... I also, um, (laughs) I kind of feel this way about Tokyo Ghoul Re, Mm. um, which is a weird case, uh, because of course the original series ends after 14 volumes, I think, um, and it ends, uh, shall we say very decisively, (laughs) um, and then I remember when Re started and they introduced this new main character and people were wondering if it was just going to be Kaneki again. And it's like, of course, it's fucking Kaneki again. He's got amnesia or some shit, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and it's like, even from that point, it was like, really? Like, he fucking died. Like, yeah. like he, we watched yeah. him die. No, what, no. Does he no, need to no. come back? We can't kill off our main character, Ray. It's not what we do. <laughs> but also, it's like, um, Ishida was, in terms of plot, especially as Ri goes on, you can tell he's pretty clearly over it. Mm-hmm. And he's right. been pretty open afterwards about how that was a very intense, like, period of depression for him. Mm-hmm. Um... Yeah. And, I mean, I hate to say you can tell, but you can tell, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it just feels very directionless. Um, and a lot of the characters don't really go anywhere. Toka is, like, one of the coolest characters in the first part of the series, and she's, like, barely in the second part. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then, and then, uh... Kaneki knocks her up and she's gone from the series <laughs> like mm, through to the end <laughs> brilliant <laughs> which is great and then um, we also have a trans male character who's like super misogynistic homophobic and transphobic mm. Uh, mm. in his very existence so it's really awesome and cool and great <laughs> but you know what some people will swear by Ri because uh, friggin Tsukiyama or whatever gets a redemption arc. Oh yeah. Um yeah. <laughs> it's like who cares? <laughs> who cares? I don't care. <laughs> yeah, well I I, so... I have read Tokyo Ghoul. I haven't read Ray. Um just because well, I never got around to it and then now it's been like ten years and I really don't care enough to get to it. <laughs> um <clears throat> And that wasn't exactly a shining recommendation you just gave, Ray. Um, <laughs> but I do remember when the chapters were coming out, um, and the there's a chapter where uh, Kaneki and what's her name uh, have sex implied. Yeah. And like, oh my god, the that dude... was not implied. <laughs> uh, well, uh, oh my god, the dude bros were like so over the moon, and I just <laughs> on Twitter was like, well. That's all I saw for, like, solid 12 hours. <laughs> Everyone losing their shit over the fact that these characters had sex. And I was like, alright, well. <laughs> cool? That was, a pretty good, that was a pretty good chapter. Uh, I mean, it's always, like, 
with Tokyo Ghoul, right? It's mm. always like those quiet interactions between characters. And that chapter I remember being kind of like that. Mm-hmm. So like it was a good chapter, but it's also like in the midst of all of this whatever. <laughs> but like I also <laughs> like, yeah, what's I, happening? I can clowns <laughs> everywhere. I can't speak to like the quality of that chapter, but I also know that the guys who were like making a big deal out of it, I don't think were making a big deal out of it because <laughs> it was a quiet uh interaction chapter between characters in a very intimate moment i think it was just like oh no, Toka was naked oh my god he got the girl let's fucking go and you're like okay well <laughs> that's creepy that's a weird way to look at you know like sec- guys i know he was a nerd to start out <laughs> with but like did you, have you seen kaneki after <laughs> <one>? <laughs> He's, yeah. like, gorgeous and buff and whatever. <laughs> He's dark. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah. think this is a win for you guys. No, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is a win for the chads or whatever. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, so mm-hmm. that's Tokyo Ghoul. <laughs> 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 like, it has moments. It's also beautiful mm-hmm. because... Ishida actually had assistance to help mm-hmm. him out. Um, but it's just not worth it. <laughs> it's just <laughs> not worth it. <laughs> the answer to everything in the end was clowns. And I just... <laughs> I never, I never want to see another clown. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Mm. But... To flip things to a more positive direction, um, are there any sequels or prequels that you would particularly like recommend that are artistically interesting that provide like a meaningful continuation of the story, or I guess add mm, the type of context that a particularly good prequel can add? Uh, so. Why does my brain not want to give me an answer to this? Um, I do think that there is like there are very good prequels and sequels out there. Um, in terms of like romance stuff, we've mentioned it a lot, but BL does this a lot. I really like Therapy Game and the further sequel to the sequel, Therapy Game Restart. Um, I think that's a very interesting. Like I, I just think it's more interesting couple than the main couple. Um, I haven't read it, but I am actually very much interested and in wanting to read uh, Devil's Line 2. I can't... Uh, yeah, it's good. It's I, good. Yeah, it's I, good. I want to read it. Korancha slash vertical. <laughs> Let me give you money. I want to read it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so absolutely that one. Um, I am a big fan of Chainsaw Man. I do think that this, like, second chapter sequel, uh, to the original series, I haven't read, like, I'm not up to date with it, but I do think that it's an interesting, like, at least initially, it's an interesting departure from the original Chainsaw Man. It's not just relying on having Denji do Chainsaw Man stuff. Um, (laughs) the new female characters interesting there's interesting character dynamics there um it's still it's wacky zany crazy self um i think that's like a fun continuation of a series that is already very popular and it hasn't it's avoided getting stale on just kind of reiterating or uh reinventing uh what the original version was um or rehashing, I guess, not reinventing, rehashing what the original first part was. Uh, Jojo is, like, a classic example of this. It's very much, like, rinse and repeat, but with, like, but this time we add add even more lasers and then crazy (laughs) bullshit. Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. Everyone's riding horses and, um... Jesus is there. Yeah. (laughs) The world is inverted and nothing is real and everything is real. Um, you know, it's, depending on where you start in that series as well, you either have a very bland prequel or you have some amazing sequels, like, it just depends, 
whether or not you <laughs> start from part one and just continue through, or if you like jump in at part three and then backtrack. Um, I am not like the biggest JoJo fan in all the world. I do enjoy it. I also haven't read a huge amount of the manga. I've seen plenty of the anime. Um, it's a fun time. <laughs> There's a reason it stayed <laughs> so popular for so long. And this is one that like each part does feel different enough that it feels like you're experiencing a, a proper like continuation of the story without having to rely on all the same gimmicks necessarily. Like, yes, there are certainly characters that come back, uh, not including Dio, obviously, but like, you know, Joseph shows up in a couple of different parts. Um, Josuke shows up in a couple of different parts. You do have recurring characters, mm. uh, but it's not like we're relying on having to see Joseph's Joestar again to enjoy the whatever crazy shenanigans is going on. Prequel wise, I actually do think that um, My Hero Academia Vigilantes is an interesting one. I think it's fun to see like a that you know setting right where everyone has hero powers, some kind of superpower. What people who aren't within the like strict school system of Hero Academy get up to mm -hmm. because this is a world that would have a lot of people out there being vigilante heroes yeah. and or villains. Um, so I think that's a fun creative like spin on the original mm -hmm. series. Um, I mentioned it, but Jujutsu Kaisen does have a, a prequel, single prequel volume or a volume zero uh, that introduces, na namely is to introduce a, a character before he enters the story proper. Um, that's a really solid one and done, like single volume. I think that's d done pretty, pretty well. Like for not having a huge amount of time with that character, it does make you quite invested in his story and his background. Yeah. So I do think that was very um, successful in what it was trying to achieve. Um, I'm sure I've read other things, but nothing is coming to mind. <laughs> <laughs> you might say something and then I'll be like, oh, I, yes, that, that too. <laughs> I agree. Um, yeah, King's Beast yeah. to that point as well. I really enjoy it and I would argue I enjoy more than the original series as well. I do like, yeah. uh, the Dawn of Arcana or whatever it is, um, but this one is much more cohesive, a little bit more polished, uh, stronger romance as well. Um, yeah. What about yourself, Brian? Huge artistic upgrade. Oh, I have no... I'm... Like, <laughs> King's Beast is beautiful. Mm. <laughs> Dawn of the Arcana is... Struggling. <laughs> But it's an early work, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Um Yeah. Uh for me, I do I I feel like this is the an unpopular opinion, but I do like Genshi Gun too. Mm -hmm. Um I I like I actually related to it quite a bit more than the original Genshi Gun mm -hmm. because I was not a dude bro in college. <laughs> yeah. I was in fact a Fujoshi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, that's the most common complaint I see is like, man, it's just not relatable like mm -hmm. the original was. And it's like, mm, I wonder why that would be. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> um, but yeah, I I like Genshi Ken too. Mm -hmm. I do think uh, there's more characters in Genshi Ken too that are like strictly kind of annoying gimmicks. Mm -hmm. Um as compared to the original series where they felt more fleshed out. Um, but I, I I still felt it was, it was quite an authentic representation of just, like, some college dweebs being dweeby together mm -hmm. in their little anime club. <laughs> um, and uh, I enjoyed it for being more of what the original was, but... Uh, representing a different side of fandom than mm -hmm. the original did. Um, 
I also wanted to be super annoying and uh, talk about some, some Moto Hagio people. <laughs> uh, I have mentioned these, of course, have not been translated unfortunately although the po clan ones presumably someday will get released in english mm-hmm. uh that's the nebulous promise <laughs> made by the translator <laughs> but uh we'll see um but uh you know i i wanted to mention uh the visitor which is a prequel to the heart of thomas uh, that, that fills in gaps within the heart of Thomas where we don't uh, it, we don't really know what Oscar's like upbringing has been like mm-hmm. um, we know far more about Eric and um, Yuli's sort of lives before they came to uh, but, but before the events of the story start mm-hmm. Um but Oscar has the most soap opera dramatic backstory, <laughs> and we know the least about it. So uh, it, it makes sense that we would get sort of a little thin volume that is that backstory, mm-hmm. which clarifies quite a bit because, again, like <laughs> the things that have happened to this child are wild. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I also like that we get. Um, because sort of the uh, the other female characters who show up in the Heart of Thomas are very much symbolic mm-hmm. of archetypes more so than actual people. Mm-hmm. It's nice to see Oscar's mother uh, fleshed out as like a real complicated, messy person. Um, it also does an interesting thing where it more firmly sets the series in like probably around the 60s um (laughs) which if you read the the book it's like kind of hard to tell when things are taking place but then you meet Siegfried and you're like I guess we're in the 60s I don't know (laughs) um (laughs) but yeah it's a good book this is a good book um and then I also wanted to mention the the Poe clan sequels uh which is just that's a case where it makes just perfect sense to continue the series whenever you want to continue it because the characters aren't going anywhere. Well, <laughs> uh, well, one of them isn't going anywhere. Um, <laughs> and there's a lot of holes in in the backstory there that you can fill in Mm. you know it's been out of chronological order for a long time uh since the beginning it's just a series of vignettes uh so it's very easy to just be like and here's another one (laughs) (laughs) uh but i i really like the poe clan sequels because they are so different from mm-hmm. the original series like it does feel like you know we're going back to to meet these characters who just have continued to be around this whole time but it's in Akio's you know more modern style um the art is uh rougher than you'll see in something like Otherworld Barbara which is another like example of like her more mature art style mm-hmm. um because she is old (laughs) Mm. (laughs) um so you'll see her using a lot of little digital cheats to make things easier on herself to draw but i am not gonna begrudge a 70 something year old woman (laughs) for doing that (laughs) (laughs) Um, and you shouldn't either you monsters (laughs) um but in terms of like her sci-fi sensibilities, I think it's really cool to see her going back and taking this lore, this vampire lore that's kind of nebulous and hard to put a pin on and kind of changes 
to fit whatever's convenient for the given story. Mm-hmm. Um, to see her going back and like really filling it in because you can tell it it was bothering her writing the sequels. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like this is how the vampires work actually mm. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like I love your sci-fi loving ass I wanna hug you mm. you're great um yeah uh, as someone who uh gets very invested in the vampire lore of various vampire series <laughs> I really enjoy um, seeing her kind of put more concrete lore onto her vampires, yeah, mm. and really choosing to set her stories like the newer vignettes in a time and a place as well, mm-hmm. um, is kind of a a. Not as much of a thing in the original series, but it is in the sequels, and it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, I guess further to that point, is there a series that you would like to see a prequel or a sequel to? Good question. Do you have an answer already? Um, sort of. Uh, I would say that there's a lot of, like, series that don't, don't lend themselves to a direct sequel or prequel in the say, in the way that we've already talked about, like, with Boruto, etc. But that do lend themselves to a kind of, uh, cinematic universe style, uh, the, the King's Beast style sequel, and... Like, for me, this is me being selfish, but, like, I want more more stuff from the Yona of the Dawn universe. I think that would be a very yeah. interesting, yeah. Uh, <laughs> rich world to explore. We know that um, this creator does, like, really fun, creative character stuff. It's And it's just, like, I don't know, There's there is kind of this slight fantasy element but it's not overwhelming um there's a lot of potential there i and i would eat it up because i am that much of a fan that on that topic mm. actually mm. i just remembered another another really good sequel yes tell me <laughs> lay it on me okay so Fushiki Yugi, uh, Genbu Kaiden. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, bringing back the classics. Mm-hmm. Um, I think in a lot of ways, Genbu Kaiden is better than the original story. <laughs> like, by a long shot. Mm. <laughs> um, I don't know if that's controversial. It probably is, but I don't care. <laughs> um, so the thing about Fushiki Yugi is that, of course, we get the stories of um, the priestess of Suzaku and the priestess of Seiryu, but there are four gods in the universe of the four gods. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So we now, at this point, have uh, Genbu Kaiden, which is about the priestess of Genbu, uh, which is a prequel to the events of Fushigi Yugi. Mm. Uh, We actually do meet a couple of the celestial warriors of Genbu Mm -hmm. um, within Fushigi Yugi proper. Uh, They are like in a essentially like they've been cryogenically frozen because that country after the events of Genbu Kaiden has gone through a major ice age. Mm. Um, because of the events of Genbu Kaiden. Uh, <laughs> so it's not a happy ending, mm. really. Mm. <laughs> uh, but we have also since gotten Byako Senki, which is about the priestess of Yako. That one I haven't read, and I, mm. I believe it was intended to be very short, but I might have heard recently that it's actually ongoing at this point, mm. so I don't know what's going on there. Um, I do know that Yu Watase, uh, I think, 
would continue to milk the Fushigi Yugi franchise forever. <laughs> um, is given the choice, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which I'm I'm pretty sure she has the choice. So mm-hmm. she is she has the power. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, Gambu Kaiden's super good. It's definitely benefiting from Yuwatase being an older, more mature creator. Mm-hmm. Uh, when yeah. making it, it just is paced so much better as a story. Mm. Uh, the priestess of Genbu, Takiko, I think her name is. She's from the Taisho era, uh, which is a cool setting. Um, she's got more going on than Miyaka really does. Uh, I found her to be a more interesting character. Her love interest, Uruki, is just so much more interesting than <laughs> Um, <laughs> which is not hard. <laughs> <laughs> and we see a lot more variation in the Celestial Warriors as well. It's not just a full reverse harem. Like, obviously there's enough hot dudes in it to, you know, warrant the fact that it is a shoujo manga. <laughs> um, but there's also female Celestial Warriors. Mm-hmm. There's one who's like a rock golem. Um, just more variety there. And they all get fleshed out in a way that I don't think... Like, like there's some of the Suzaku Celestial Warriors who really don't have a lot going on. Mm. <laughs> um, so yeah. I, Yona of the Dawn reawakened my memories of the Fushigi Yuki prequel. And whilst, whilst you're, not that it's related to Fushigi at all, but I also remembered another good sequel, which is kind of one of those series that it's just the second chapter of the main series, um, is Holic Ray. Uh, and that's just because I like Holic and I want more Holic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I wish it was not on yes. hiatus for four million years. Um, please <laughs> give me more of that clamp. It is the one series from me that I truly enjoy with all of my heart, and I would give you <laughs> money for more of it. <laughs> yeah. I would also say that I feel like Holic Ray is a case where it feels like Clamp genuinely had ideas for continuing the story. Yeah. Um, and that's what they're doing, and I say that about Genbu Kaiden as well, mm. where it's like you can tell this was stewing in her head. She's like, I have this whole backstory for the northern <laughs> country. Um, which is, I mean, that makes sense for Clamp, because mm-hmm. they've always got way too many ideas. <laughs> um, for better and for worse. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that one's also good. I definitely have not read more of Ray than like the first few volumes, but... Well, there's only four, yeah. so it's not like you're that far behind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just want there to be more. Uh, is there any other like uh, series that you think would merit a prequel slash sequel spinoff? Hmm. I had an answer, and then I didn't. And you started and talking I... about Fushigi Yuki. Um, I'm sorry. No, that's that's completely fine. <laughs> um... <laughs> oh, yeah, mm. my answer. Mm. Um, okay, weird one. Mm. Maybe not that weird. Rose of Versailles. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, it ends with, obviously, Marie Antoinette's death, and I think most people would say that the Rose of Versailles actually ends too late. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it The series kind of dies with uh, Lady Oscar mm-hmm. Francois Dujarge, mm-hmm. Uh as you can hear us detail in our uh, detailed episode about the Rose of Versailles. Which is not a spoiler, because, but... like, come on, it is, this series yeah. is so old. Uh. <laughs> yeah, it's, I'm sorry uh, that you haven't read this 50 year old series yet <laughs> um, t- about history <laughs> uh, but 
I don't know, man. I just feel like the the revolutionaries are such interesting, fascinating people mm-hmm. in history, and they had so much beef and drama with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and we only like get the barest glimpse of them like towards the end of the series, yeah. and I just. And, and obviously, like, their lives continue on and get messier and messier and messier um, after the death of Marie Antoinette. Mm-hmm. So I just think it would, especially knowing Ryoko Ikeda's political leanings, mm-hmm. um, I think it'd be really interesting to see her take on those historical figures and the events of the later part of the French Revolution, because it really ends quite early mm-hmm. um, in that historical period. So I agree. I also yeah. think that, like, if if Rose of Versailles had ended with Lady Oscar, right, the death of Lady Oscar, and that was the end, and then, like, mm-hmm. the death of Marie Antoinette, like, I understand Marie Antoinette is technically the main character, but she's not the main character of Rose of Versailles. <laughs> She initially was, but, like, nobody gives a shit, right? Um, so, like, if you yeah, want to... Yeah, Yu Yu Hakusho was originally, like, a whodunit, like... Mm-hmm. <laughs> and Tagashi made the correct decision in changing it. So, like, I feel that, on one hand, Ikeda probably wanted to do, like, a full circle. You know, this is the start of Marie's story, this is the end of Marie's story. But nobody was reading mm. Rose of Versailles for Marie Antoinette. So what you do is you finish that series with the death of Lady Oscar. And then you can have a sequel that is just focused on Marie Antoinette's like final year in prison. It gives you more time to flesh out kind of the... Mm-hmm. Make her a little bit more sympathetic. You have more of the revolutionary stuff happening You can have some of these other characters make a reappearance or have a cameo and you can give her a a little show like Marie Antoinette Mm. and Rosalie Mm. actually interacting. So it's not so fucking weird. Yeah. Rosalie's like, I really care about you person who indirectly ruined my life. Exactly. (laughs) Like you could, you could flesh out that relationship so much more. You can, really bring the reader back into being very sympathetic to Marie because again like she's she doesn't make good decisions throughout the entirety of the series and so it's hard to feel bad for her when she ultimately gets her head cut off um like yes she's murdered but like also she kind of instigated a lot of that shit it, she's not fully yeah, I feel like if it didn't feel so rushed, like mm-hmm. if, if there was that chance to flesh it out, because I do actually think that the Rose of Versailles interpretation of Marie Antoinette is like super interesting yes. compared to a lot of portrayals of her. And yes. I like seeing, even in that latter part of her story, her keep vacillating between like, you know, I will die for my country, I've done all these things wrong, and also being like, you know how dare these people Mm -hmm. you know um i i think that that more nuanced and complicated take on her uh is super good and interesting it's Mm -hmm. just like in that execution at the end it's so rushed that it kind of suffers there Mm -hmm. i completely agree so you could have the like og rose of versailles you don't change anything except for you cut it right at the the death of our fave girl lady oscar uh because that's the only person character that most people care about um and then hey hey (laughs) andre also died on the Day of the uh, storming the Bastille. Yes. So we have the death of Andre. <laughs> we have the death of Lady Oscar. And that's kind of the tragic, you know, uh, it's a Shakespearean tragedy of, you know, these these people who believed in something and loved each other, but it's just a tumultuous time in history. And there were 
on the wrong side of things until they were on the right side of things and <laughs> blah 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 and and that would be punchy uh it would be an ending that like you know caused an upset the fans would be cr- screaming and crying um uh, which they were anyway but then if that was the end oh my god oh my god that would have been just uh a way to end it with a bang. And then there would absolutely be enough fan interest to be like, okay, well, what's the direct result from that? And you ha- you spend some time. It doesn't have to be a huge amount of time. It can be five volumes. It can be three volumes. Fleshing out some of Marie's life prior to her execution. You, f- you feed in some more interesting revolutionary side characters you, you plant the seeds there and then you have kind of self-contained short series that's a direct sequel about the last year of Marie Antoinette or 18 months or whatever it was of Marie Antoinette's life in prison as this as this monarch who has lost everything but she still has her pride but she still recognizes her own um, place within the situation um, and and has taken some level of responsibility um, also amidst all of this um, uh, economic turmoil within the French populace and the everyday lives of people and why they've gotten to this point which we see a little bit of in dribs and drabs throughout the you know the original series and then so you have that five volumes or whatever it is And then you can be like, oh, and remember those revolutionaries? Here's a whole new (laughs) series just about them. And like the following years after Marie Antoinette's death. So it's almost completely disconnected, but still tangential. Like it's obviously, all of these things are related, but they don't have to exist within the same complete Mm -hmm. storyline. You can break it into bits and and feed a very specific, cohesive story to the audience part by part, rather than trying to cram everything in and not being able to cover everything with enough time and as much nuance as you would necessarily want. And then if it's good enough, then there's going to be fan demand for Ryoko Ikeda to cover other historical events. Yes! And then... There's an alternate universe in which she's still drawing Rosa Versailles spinoffs, <laughs> even now. Except it's not even about France anymore. <laughs> it's about Bulgaria or something. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, you know, there's there's a lot of potential there. Because history is such an interesting thing to pull from. Um, there's so many interesting stories throughout history from a whole variety of people, from a whole variety of um, communities as well. Like, this is I sort of kind of tangent, not tangentially related, but it kind of feeds back into why, like, Orb, uh, the whatever, <laughs> the cycles of the Earth, um, <sighs> was such a disappointment because that has so much potential <laughs> and it's it ended up being the worst thing in the world. Um... <laughs> A, A, second worst. <laughs> second worst thing in the world. <laughs> um, so. People keep praising the Darwin incident we're not gonna, on my Twitter feed. We're not talking about Darwin incident. We, we can't allow that monkey to hijack any more of our time. Um, you know what really needs a sequel? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, but, okay, we're not talking about Darwin Incident. We're talking about Orb, which is also horrible, and we go into it in great detail in our uh, worst, or most hated debuts of 2023 uh, January podcast. Oh, okay. Um, but, <laughs> what I'm saying is that, that history like has so many interesting characters. So many interesting people. Mm-hmm. There's been so many interesting stories and discoveries and whatever. And, like, there's also 
there's uh, always the risk of a, like whitewashing history in any of these sorts of uh, historical reinterpretations of things, especially if we're talking about like noted explorers, etc. But like there's there's some really interesting science stuff. There's some really interesting, uh, not just obviously revolutionary France, but throughout Europe, there's a lot of turmoil. There's I we could pull from Russian history. There's so much shit we could explore. There do there's so many revolutions there that would be also very interesting. Um that has potential for retellings, as we know, because obviously the we we do have versions of that, not within the manga sphere, but within, you know, f- film and television and, and mm-hmm. books and whatever else. That if if a creator like hits it out of the park with a historical reimagining of a notable character, right? A notable individual from history. In Rose of Versailles' case, obviously being Marie Antoinette, although again, arguably it's not really about her. But um, you know, what or Cleopatra or bloody I don't know, someone as uh, Alexander Fleming, who's not a very sexy character, but is an interesting person nonetheless. Uh, like, there's there's a lot of potential in notable people and notable periods. And also, it's, it, you could lean into it being quasi-educational um, about this thing. Um... And then tie it all back into how it relates to now. And maybe people have all been the same throughout history. Or maybe we are not so different from our ancestors as we doth think. Um, but, yeah. we. I mean, in so far as, like, English manga stuff, aside from Rose of Versailles, the only manga I can think that kind of is set within a similar era is fucking uh Gerard and Jacques which is a Fumi Yoshinaga BL manga about two guys within the French court um <laughs> who are having a, an mm-hmm. illicit affair there's there it's so mm-hmm. interesting in in we could be <laughs> using and utilizing so much of more of this and I mean, we do see a lot of, like, Japanese history. I mean, that's not... Inosan. Huh? Inosan. Inosan, yes. Yes. Innocent. Innocent. Inosan. That is true. And I completely forgot that existed because I kind of wiped it from my <laughs> mind. Um, but that is... You're not wrong. You are not wrong. That is another one. Uh, but in saying that, even so, there's not... I would say that there is a huge... There's not enough. There's not enough. We get a lot of, like, Japanese historical manga, which makes sense, whether it be, (laughs) you know, Blade of the Immortal or fucking The Elusive Samurai or anything in between. Uh, Showa is a good one. Um, Which makes sense because, obviously, these are comics coming from the island nation of Japan. So... Most creators are familiar with Japanese history. Uh, but I don't know. I feel like there's more to be plumbed from the depths of world history. Yeah, for sure. Um, for sure, for sure, for sure. <laughs> uh, any other series that you desperately think need a sequel now (laughs) Mm. or prequel Uh, I'm trying to think of what I've read that I know is completed and that I would be interested in continuing because as we know and I think you're the same Ray like short and sharp I don't I don't need a million spin-offs of my favorite thing (laughs) Mm -hmm. I'm happy for it to end and feel satisfied that it is concluded and I don't need to read the next series featuring half the same characters and 
uh, 10 years later. But mm-hmm. I do think not really a sequel, like sort of a sequel, more kind of a spin off. One thing that I do think would benefit from um, an extension of the story, maybe is the right word, is um, Blue Flag. I think if we had like a, mm, a spin off yeah. featuring the relationship between the end couples, quote unquote. Um, and this mm-hmm. is not maybe a spoiler, but like that would probably lead to some more good faith interpretations of the ending, which mm-hmm. I yeah really like. I didn't have any major issues with the ending, but I know that a lot of people did. And when you have a coming of age romance manga that focuses on one couple, even though it's about the relationship of like all of these kids. And notably the friendship between these two male characters. Um, There are a lot of people who are obtuse and think that, like, just because it wasn't shown on page doesn't mean that that would happen. Like, oh, they turned it gay for the end. It's like, I, no, I don't think they turned it gay for the end. That's not, did you not read the whole series up until this point? It's been gay this whole time. It's been gay, it's been very gay this whole time. You just aren't happy that the the heterosexual main featured couple within the series was an end game because they were fucking 17 years old. Like, that's, that's not how life works. Um, but I think that, one, it would just be interesting to see their relationship develop from friendship to romantic relationship, because that is always kind mm-hmm. of a difficult and interesting, um, thing to navigate. But also, again, it would lead, it would kind of quash some of the, again, these, these disingenuous arguments of like well that just came out of nowhere it's like um oh well i don't think we were reading the same series but (laughs) okay (laughs) go off (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah no i definitely agree that's one where i really would like to see the intermittent 10 years or whatever Mm. For sure. Yeah. Very good. Um, and then, so, I guess, kind of counterpoint to to that, is there, I mean, and this is probably very easy to answer, but is there any series that you would absolutely never want to see a prequel and or sequel for? You're just happy it it's done, you don't need any more, you don't want any more, you'd be kind of disappointed if there was more (laughs) (laughs) Hmm. I don't know like (laughs) that's an obtuse question like it's not it's an impossible thing to really answer because you're like well most things I just am happy you know what it's an anime, but mm. like Revolutionary Girl Utena. Oh yeah, yeah. I never want to see a single second <laughs> of what the world looks like outside of Otori Academy because I, <laughs> I mean, I feel like the point is that it looks like our world mm. outside of Otori Academy. It's mm. it's the world of adults, um, and I think that any attempt at a sequel would would ruin that impression. Um, as much as people want to see uh, Uthena and Anthe make out within the series <laughs> context. Um, <laughs> that is to say, I do kind of believe the interpretation of the movie as a sequel. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there is that as well. But um, that one also ends with them st- setting foot in the world of adulthood. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> um, Yeah. The super salty answer is, um, for me, is, is Tokyo Ghoul. <laughs> <laughs> it ended so well. Mm. So well. And then it, it just 
kept going. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, G? That's a very valid answer. Um, I would say, and these are like series that have, I guess, quote unquote, potential for spinoffs or sequels, but I never want them to have this. Because like, again, there's, there's a lot of series that are fine, like they end, that's it. There's absolutely nothing compelling the creator to make more. These yeah. series, I you could argue, like, there's potential that the creator could make more. I do not want it. I will if it exi- yeah. if it became a reality, I would not engage with it, even if they are like favorite series of mine. Uh, first and point mm-hmm. being Full Metal Alchemist. I do not need any more of that series. Mm. That series is complete in its form. It's had a bunch of like spin-off movies and things and I don't have issues with that, but I do not need, you know, Edward and Alphonse's children running around <laughs> doing alchemy. Okay. I don't want it. I don't want to see Mustang and Riza in 10 years as, you know, Fuhrer and whatever. I don't care. I don't Ugh. want it. I'm happy with where it ended. The story was very complete, cohesive, told just a narrative that started and ended and it was very, very good and I don't need any more. I don't care. I don't want any of the side characters to get a spin-off. I don't want to see Ling as emperor. I don't want to see anything. I know that that exists, and in the epilogue, they're all living happily ever after. That's all I need. I don't need any continuation. (laughs) And I certainly don't need any prequels. I don't give a shit. We got enough of, like, backstory within the series itself. I don't want to see Hohenheim as a slave in any longer capacity than I saw him within the series doing that shit. I don't need it. It's not interesting. It's not cool. Um, <laughs> further to that point, um, I think that Haikyuu exists as a perfect, a perfect series. It doesn't need any continuation. I don't need to see the next uh, team of uh, Karasuno high school volleyball players. We ended at a good point. We had a time skip. That's enough of a sequel to me. The characters are happy. Yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to see the next generation of bright-eyed boy volleyball players in the Crows. Karasuno. I don't. It's fine. I don't care. They're happy. We don't need any more. That's all good. The <laughs> other other one. Um. Is also, I, so, this is maybe a bit of a reach, but also maybe not a bit of a reach at all. But, like, I don't want a spin-off about Natori or anyone from Natsume's Book of Friends. <laughs> I like Natsume's story. Yeah. It, it's, it's perfect as is. He, as a character, is has had some beautiful character growth it's important that it's his story he he has initially that disconnect from the exorcist life he knows nothing about this underground society he's just an orphan kid trying to find out about himself and about his past and he has a Tolkien cat bodyguard and he runs into mm-hmm. these adults who, like, do know more about the world. I don't want to know any more about the world. I don't want to know any more about Natori being a sad kid in an exorcist family. <laughs> I don't care. I don't want it. We get enough of... Counterpoint. Yes. I would read a spinoff that is exclusively just Nyanko sensei hanging out in like the <laughs> grossest seediest bars and just being an asshole I <laughs> while, mean... while Natsume's at school <laughs> <laughs> you are correct in that Nyanko sensei is the only interesting character to feature 
I don't want to know anything else about any other human characters. They don't care. They, I don't, I don't care about them. They don't matter. Natsume needs to be the focus. And if he became secondary, um, it wouldn't be the series that it is. And I, you know, arguably the mangaka is very good at what she does. So, like, she'd probably make it fabulous. But I don't want it. I don't want it. It doesn't need to exist. <laughs> Those are my answers. Now that I'm <laughs> thinking along the slice of life mythology mm -hmm. uh, like line of thinking, I'm thinking about how Colette decides to die like finished right as I was leaving Japan. Mm. And I think that there could be a sequel to that one. Because mm. obviously the, the main story is about um, Hades and Colette. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, other Olympians show up. I mean, Hades isn't an Olympian, but um, mm. other Greek gods show up throughout the story. Um, and, and Colette also has all of her little friends from the the clinic. And I, I think going either direction with, like, a sequel would be interesting. Mm. Certainly, like, obviously going with one of the other like mythological characters would be the most interesting i think mm. um whether it's like you know hermes you know finding a girlfriend i don't know <laughs> <laughs> um uh he, he hangs out on the roads a lot mm. he, he meets a lot of humans i think it, i could see like a spinoff about him um or zeus uh likes to spend his time as a cat in that series. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of directions that Alto Yukimura could go if she wanted to mm. with that. Because um, it's just a very chill series. And I think expand... A, again, going the, the shoujo route of, like, here's another couple mm -hmm. that's a human and a god. Um would be just fine. I'd be totally fine with that. <laughs> Very good. Um, oh, oh, okay. Well, I think that... Uh, is there anything else we need to talk about? Or is that, that it? We've, we've talked about two hours. <laughs> um, We're fine. We're good. We're good. Stop. Stop. <laughs> um... Yeah, I, I think just generally this is not a unique thing to manga or anime for that matter. Anime is a different story because obviously they are adaptations usually of, of a, a, a work anyway. So any kind of sequel would just be a continuation More. of the original work. <laughs> um, not all the time, but usually. Uh, but... This is not something that is unique to just manga. We see this a lot with novels. We see this a lot with English language comics. We see this a lot with, well, a lot of things. A lot of games. All sorts of things. Um, but I do think that manga is this sort of unique thing, especially compared to, like, uh, Cape Comics, where it's a single creator who has a individual vision. Yes, there's assistance, but it'll be the same creator from beginning to end. And then if there's a continuation or a spin-off or whatever else, it's usually facilitated by that original creator. They do have creative control over mm -hmm. how it continues. It's not like S Superman who's had so many people working on it for the entirety of its its existence or his existence, um, each bringing their own interpretation of the character to the fold. Um, but it is, it's an interesting one because arguably fans or a lot of fans do like having more of what they enjoy, right? Like sequels, no matter what the format, people do very often call for sequels. Like, as soon as something finishes, it's like, we need more! Mm -hmm. And you're like, no! 
No, you don't. That's the brain wa- That's the brain rot talking, guys. Yes. Yes. <laughs> don't allow the brain worms to keep running your life. It's okay for things to end. That's how life is. And it is okay, and it is sometimes even better than okay. Um, but it is this, it's this interesting thing because sometimes you do get these sequels or spinoffs from creators or franchises that aren't necessarily from the same creative team, um, but still play into the, the world, a la the four million different versions of Attack on Titan spinoffs. Or, of course, you have direct sequels or continuations, as we've talked about. Some more necessary than others. I would argue that, in some cases, it would be a detriment to not have the continuation. Or, uh, maybe not continuation, the the prequel, the backstory to it. It does give a richness Mm -hmm. to the overall story, Mm -hmm. the overall um, narrative being told. So there's certainly strengths within this. But at the same time, at least within the English market, we don't always see those sequels or spin-offs unless it is a huge popular series like mm-hmm. Attack on Titan, like Demon Slayer, like Naruto, like a Death Note has a sequel spin-off series technically volume um it is mostly the shonen and specifically shonen jump uh series that we do see a lot of this from not completely but usually uh either that or bl which obviously is a completely different animal (laughs) and serving Mm -hmm. a completely different well mostly different audience i won't say completely different audience those fujos (laughs) run the shonen jump uh (laughs) everything yeah so nothing within jump would be successful if they what didn't have the food so we must acknowledge this um (laughs) but to that point like i as said i would i am hankering i am chomping at the bit for devil's line 2 a, a direct sequel to of fantastic seinen that i love and that we've talked about extensively on this podcast before i want that sequel it exists i want kodansha to give it to me and i would posit that we probably will get it from kodansha eventually you know they they do tend to surprise me every so often and a direct sequel of a series that they do already have the rights to and have licensed and published in their in its entirety is sort of a no-brainer because you are ex- relying on existing fans. This the fact that Parasite Reversi just got licensed like is another testament to that. Um when a good example of how this is still like th- this is something that publishers do do. They know that there's an inbuilt fan base. I just want more stuff that mm-hmm. I care about <laughs> to get <laughs> to be brought over to give to be given to me because you know I don't dislike Naruto I don't dislike Demon Slayer I've read both of those they're solid action adventure shonen jump series for 12 year olds they're great <laughs> I don't need to read the 14 prequel novels about Kakaishi or uh, anyone. I don't, I don't know that I want that. (laughs) Kakashi? I like how you did the Freudian slip of replacing, I assume, did you mean Kakashi? (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) I did mean Kakashi. (laughs) The Freudian slip of you you meaning to say Kakashi and you instead say a series that you like much better. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say I don't have any biases. I've never claimed that, right? I, um... <laughs> and to that point, please give me... I'm very... I'm actually very happy that um, Yellow Tanabe's new 
series is available on Manga Plus or one of the one of the series one of the mm. subscription services we have now. Yeah. I want Birdman. Give me Birdman. It's not a sequel or a prequel to anything, but I want it. And I'm <laughs> uh now that My Hero Academia is over, uh maybe people want more superhero stuff. Maybe. So maybe <laughs> it has a chance. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> anyway, that's enough of me ranting about stuff that's not necessarily related to anything. <laughs> um, next, I mean, that's all I do, so... Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> uh, next month, we are having a series spotlight. If that's okay with you, Ray? Um, yes, this one I'm excited about. It's a wonderful series, and it's I'm... spooky. It is spooky. It's spooky season next month. Which is always exciting. I love doing spooky season uh, episodes. This one, uh, I think, probably is a little bit more well known now because it has had an anime. I don't know how good that anime was, but um, it it certainly would have more eyeballs on it now. We're going to be talking about Hell's Paradise, which is yeah. hell good. If you haven't read this manga, I encourage you to do so because I'm sure we will spoil a shit ton. Uh, <laughs> and it is worth reading. It's if you like action horror, body horror specifically, um, but also like wholesome found family and just the goodest boy <laughs> protagonist, then um, yeah, check out read Hell's Paradise <laughs> before we talk about it and and wax poetic and ruin everything for you because we will not. We will not shy away from spoilers, as per usual. Um, yes. Yeah. So, uh, we'll be talking about that la- next month. If you do have any questions for us to answer for next month's podcast, please leave them either on Twitter when I send out the the post asking for questions. Hopefully, not just twelve hours before we record. Um, <laughs> otherwise you can also leave comments on Spotify as well as on YouTube. You can find this podcast on my YouTube channel, Simply G, that's Simply G double E. And you can also find me on the site formerly known as Twitter at G, G double E underscore reads. Uh, follow Ray on her social media. She is w- at Whimsical Picks, P-I-X. Um, yeah, this podcast is available on pretty much every podcasting pl- platform that still exists. Spotify, uh, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts. I think that's it. I, I don't actually know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you can find us there and listen to us. And if you enjoy either this episode or our episodes in general, we would appreciate a rating and or review. We do... You know, that that would mean so much to us. Uh, we're not a huge enterprise here. <laughs> we're just <laughs> two fans talking about the things that we enjoy. And sometimes the things we don't enjoy. Um, so, you know, we, we rely on your validation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, thank you so, so much for listening. I'll catch you in the next episode. Bye till then. Bye, guys.